Welcome on in. This is the Rotowire Fantasy Football Podcast for Thursday, December 8th. I'm John McKechnie. That's Mario Puig. Today we are digging into all of the NFL Week 14 slate, all the fantasy tough lineup decisions that you got to make. It's a crucial week. Playoff time is just around the corner. A lot of bye weeks too, so tricky, tricky navigation here. We're going to get into all that here. Let's go. Welcome on in. This is the Road Wire Fantasy Football Podcast, again, presented by our friends over at No House Advantage, John McKechnie and Mario Puig, hanging out with you on this Thursday. Mario, how are things in your world? Oh, fine. Uh, as always, it's too windy, but uh, you know, other other things are fine, I guess. Excellent. What about you? Uh, yeah, keep, keeping with the weather theme, uh, the sun is out for the first time in a week. It's been like, uh, you ever see the the Johnny Depp, Jack the Ripper movie no. uh, from hell. I think it was called uh, is it, basically the movies just hell where you are right now. It, it was very it was. foggy. I don't know if there was a guy running around with a dagger or anything, but uh, oh, regardless, it was very foggy the, the other day uh, around the lake. Uh, there was a really, it was, it was really dense. Uh, so dense that you couldn't see uh, like all the lit houses on the other side. So it looked like a, a just like endless black wall around the lake. And I, uh, I was legitimately frightened by it. I got a little afraid. Yeah, Mad- Madison this time of year definitely has some like scary nature elements to it. No, no question. Uh, our guy Jay says hello. Hello to Jay. Hello, oh, Jay. You have a one of those tropical trees in your avatar. You don't. You have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, he's li- he's living right. Um, but uh, speaking of living right, we get treated to a Thursday night game for the ages tonight. I I can already hear Al Michaels just trying to get through this three hour broadcast. Like he is, he should not be subjected to this in his dotage. Yeah. Uh, it's going to, it's going to sound like one of those Mexican soccer game announcers. It's going to be crazy, but, but um, not the um, Telemundo broadcast, like just like the, the Simpsons one, like and he passes it, and he passes it, and he passes it. Yeah, so it's <laughs> it's, it's not going to be great. Um, but you know what? We're we're going to power through because hey, you're hoping Baker starts. It sounds impossible, but uh, let's hope for that because we want this to be entertaining. If we have to, if we we must be aware that it exists. I know, and like so. Okay, so to to break it down, in case we haven't established it already, we got the Raiders going down to L.A. Uh, to face the Rams. Raiders now six and a half point favorites. The Rams obviously go ahead and sign Baker Mayfield earlier in the week with, with the Matthew Stafford stuff going on, looking like he's probably not going to play again th- this year. Um, you know, we, we have a potential for a guy that was just signed off the street that was jettisoned by the Carolina Panthers, mind you, um, just, just a couple of days ago. And he might be in this game, which it, which is unbelievable to me. And, and it was just when, I, I thought on Sunday that the Rams played a game that they didn't look completely miserable the entire time for, I think, the first time all season, really. They looked like they were having a little bit of fun against the Seahawks, obviously, until they, they melted down at the very end. But they looked a little loose. They, they didn't look like they, they were just simply doing their job and doing it poorly. Um, and now I feel like Baker wrecks any of that sort of like, uh, hey, we got nothing to lose type of mentality. Yeah, it's it, you mentioned it's it's kind of like difficult to believe. For me, it's literally unbelievable. Like I just don't think it's actually. True. I hope it's true. I'd love to see Baker Mayfield uh, with what like a, a flight time to study the playbook. Uh, like he's just like flying. He's getting on two flights because he got claimed on Tuesday. Uh, so it's like two plane rides. He's he's not like he literally can't practice. Like he, there's no way, right? He couldn't have done anything with the team. Uh, so. That's funny. Uh, or maybe they did like some walkthrough thing yesterday, but he's, he's basically just read the playbook and we're supposed to believe they're going to put him on the field. It, it would it would be unfair to Mayfield to the point that I wouldn't even like make fun of how bad the, the ensuing play was. And, and normally I'd like to, you know, laugh at that guy. It's, it's uh, he, he kind of he kind of brings it on himself being like being like a 
like spoiled rich kid kind of attitude and just like you're like almost what like 28 or something now you're just acting like a child uh, a very rich child it's it's just it's just ridiculous and yeah I, I i would imagine that if there was something to the rams having some sort of like um you know improved morale for whatever reason uh maybe rallying around wolford a little bit whatever it was bringing in baker mayfield and just being like he you got to play for him now it's like that's that's not going to appeal to anybody on the team uh nope. and mayfield has not had a way of like uh making people like him uh at least since his like uh, texas uh, not texas uh, oklahoma career so i i think it, it literally it doesn't even make any logistical sense it seems impossible to me so uh Schefter reported that he that mayfield would play if wolford can't play with his neck injury i just i i just think it, it might be a case of a team lying because they knew they could get a lie in the media and maybe like this is mcveigh giving Schefter's like so that so they uh if they have to go with Perkins, maybe uh, the Raiders won't have like spent as much time looking at run defending at quarterback or something like that. Yeah, so some gamesmanship uh, could be afoot. That's basically all the Rams have left in in like with with their hand for for it's this like season. Like the worst magic trick, like smoke and mirrors with just uh, n no materials on hand. Yeah, that's a, a real Joe Bluth uh, type of trick. <laughs> uh, it's not a trick; exactly. it's an illusion. Um, but, He's trying uh, to hide the lighter fluid. It's and it's not going well. Um, let's see. So be, beyond that, I, I think the other kind of main fantasy takeaway from the uh, from the Rams this past week was Cam Akers is alive again. Do you trust it this week? McVeigh has literally gone back and forth on this. I feel like every week for uh, I don't know eight weeks in a row now. It's like they they just cut the guy that they refused to let Akers play over uh that that whole however however long that was and uh ronnie rivers started a game uh what like six weeks ago but hasn't played a snap since it's ridiculous and mcveigh is basically completely out of line like someone needs to get him and sneed whoever is responsible for handling the players like it, it's it's gone completely wrong and it's it's going to be an issue for for them getting that team competitive ever again as long as they're handling things like this uh so i will say Akers has two 60 yard games in the past three weeks in the, you know, the two touchdowns last week. So even though Kyron Williams played like 20, 25 more snaps than him two weeks ago, uh, at least we have at this point, like two out of three weeks, it's been Akers. So I'm not going to tell anyone that, that uh, McVay can't go back to Kyron Williams here. I, I, he could go to Ronnie Rivers here. He doesn't need a reason. He's not going to give anybody any for any like warning on it. He's not gonna. He's not gonna uh, have a justification because there isn't any. But he he is liable to do it anyway. Uh, with that said, it, it seems like it would be like. I, I, this doesn't even really make any sense. But uh, even though like McVeigh keeps going to new lows that I didn't think was possible each time, this would be a new low yet if he went away from Acres. So uh, Acres clearly got a bunch more passing down snaps last week than he did the the other sixty yard game uh, two three weeks ago. And, uh, yeah, I, it would be insane for McVay to, to like, yank him out of the lineup after he had that game and the two touchdowns when, like, was that the first time they ran for a touchdown in, like, six weeks or something? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's been miserable there in L.A. this year. And, and you know, I kind of want to – this has less to do with the game and more just the, the kind of discourse on, on Twitter yesterday. So I want to pose it to you. Um, I, I know I saw you tweeting about it. So when it comes, <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry. You, you know it's up. Uh, so when you look when you look at this Rams trade for Matthew Stafford in <laughs> in, in its long haul, you know who who wins it? And like if you're on the Rams side of it, do you care even that that you are looking at the thousand year winter at this point because you got the Super Bowl? Like I I, I don't think that they're digging themselves out of this hole in the next four or five years, especially if they keep operating uh, the way that they do with, with just skewing the draft, basically. John, you're um, confused. Uh, okay. I, I got to cut you off. You're, you're mm -hmm. boring me to tears with this this nonsense about uh, Super Bowls being worth winning or whatever that was. Uh, John, <laughs> the point of running a team and, and, and what the measure of actual team success is, the, 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 the success of building a team is measured by how how close are you to the salary cap floor? 
Are, are you, uh, you, you can't be beneath the floor. The, the NFL literally won't let you do it, unfortunately. But the other, the, other than that, the best thing that you can do as a team is to be like right at the salary cap floor. Uh, and, and also, uh, you get bonus points for the less uh, dead money you have on your cap. So uh, the way you win uh, as a team is not by winning a Super Bowl. It's by, you know, winning a wild card berth every year and always being like two or three players short of a Super Bowl because that's a better like uh, win per dollar kind of calculation. And that's sure. like, we, we only care about efficiency around here. We don't care about uh, magnitudes. Or, or peaks or anything like that. We just want to be efficient on a dollar per win kind of basis. And that's why the trade was a huge uh, blunder by the Rams, John. They, they, yes, they won a Super Bowl, which uh, most fan bases would tell you they'd trade a Super Bowl win for like 10 years of just utter crud. But they're idiots, John. They should understand that that's not what being a fan is about. Being a fan is about helping and, and praying for your team's owner to make a lot of money this quarter yes. and uh, to use that money to uh, put forth legislative initiatives that uh, undermine the labor markets. And if you don't care about those things more than a Super Bowl win, you're just, you're just a dullard and I have no respect for you. Yeah, you're just a, a dumb fan at that, at that point. And, and, you know, if, if you can get to the salary cap floor, where 95% of your salary allocation is just at the quarterback position, even better. That's the best stuff. Yes. Yeah. So you want to get your non quarterback expenditures to be uh, the lowest uh, percentage possible of, of your team's budget. And uh, eventually you, you, uh, you attain um, you know, the blessing of, of heaven. That's right. Okay. All right. So thank you for setting me straight on that one. Uh, you know, I, I was confused as to whether it was good to win a Super Bowl or not. Um, uh, the, you know, the, I will say the the Lions. It was a good trade for the Lions too. Yeah. It was like a good trade for both teams because uh, the Rams could not win. Which are, that the, the the funniest part of all of this uh, idiotic dialogue too has been uh, the idea that t this year Jared Goff is better than Stafford. Th there's no reason to respect anyone who tells you that. Don't don't consider them a human. <laughs> and trust me. I don't. Um, so, <laughs> um, absolutely yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. No. So, I mean, so what if the Rams basically become the, the, uh, Miami Marlins uh, of the NFL where they just show up every couple decades, win a, win a championship and then go back in, into the basement. Um, that's maybe that's their new existence. I, I don't the know ideal, if the Marlins fans really the care. The ideal NFL franchise is probably the Mike Brown Bengals. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. That this indoor facility. In Cincinnati, Ohio, what, what use is that? Um, let's just go to Kentucky and hang out or something on a <laughs> steakhouse that floats away. Um, but but uh, beyond all of that, uh, bringing us back into this game, are you buying the Raiders turnaround at all? Uh, in the sense that it was puzzling how they were ever so bad earlier this year that you know it's, it would have it would have been impressive if they have kept being that bad, uh, especially that Saints game. But I. I'm I'm on board with the uh, the uh, theory that they just had COVID that week and Devonte Adams had COVID and that's all that happened there. Uh, we kind of thought that the defense might suck. We 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 didn't expect the Raiders to be good this year necessarily, but we thought like the offense, uh, since it was working fine to begin with, we kind of just thought, well, at least that or I anyway, I, I assumed like, well, at least the offense will kind of be fine, especially since Devonte Adams is here now. But uh, yeah, it was needlessly difficult for much of the year. I, I don't, I don't think that they'll be, not this year anyway. Will they? Will the Raiders be able to be good consistently against like good defenses? But in this game, their field positioning should be so favorable, and the Rams are so just destroyed. The personnel is, is obliterated by injuries all over the place. Uh, Jalen Ramsey is active, but a uh, we, we can't take for a given that he'll shadow Adams and B there's no reason to think Adams would be particularly slowed by it. If, if Adams can get the better of Patrick Sertan, then particularly if Ramsey keeps playing the way he has this year, then Ramsey just is maybe a speed bump kind of thing to Adams. And uh, yeah, aside from that, it's like particularly if Walford can't play and play credible quarterback, then the Rams offense could be, uh, you know, an all time stinker in this one, even though the Raiders defense totally sucks. 
Yeah, that that's my concern. So, I mean, initially, I, I thought that six and a half on the road was was going to be a little bit too much uh, to to trust with the Raiders. But I, I think with this quarterback situation, um, suddenly with, with Baker Mayfield, that makes me feel worse about it on the Rams side. So, I I, I do think that the Raiders kind of end up winning this one rather comfortably in, in what becomes you know a, a fairly uh, forgettable, hopefully uh, Thursday night game. Uh, Jay does have a question for us before we get on over to our next game. Who do you trust more in PPR, Jeff Wilson or Fournette this week? Uh, it's really tough. Yeah, it's, it's. I was gonna say it's really tough to trust Fournette almost no matter who the alternative is at this point. But Wilson has a great matchup. He should have yes. a huge game. Yeah, give me Wilson. Um, Fournette, you know, you you have the Rashad White issue, and then also the the defense that he's going against is uh, pretty salty. It's pretty tough. Um, and and if we all had front row seats for the the Buccaneers game on Monday night, that offense also really sucks. So um, it's yeah. over. Yeah, I, I, I didn't. I thought Tom would just live forever, and apparently he's he has not ascended to like cyborg status. He's he's just an old guy trying to play quarterback now. It's yeah. It's uh, as someone who's been waiting for his downfall for the better part of like a decade and a half at this point. Um, I wanted that, it to I'm be. Excited. I wanted it to be more uh, humorous, you know, not just not just like a looking like a like a baby deer just like stumbling around like that. I, I wanted to see Tom uh, look look like he's at full strength and just still end up with uh, the egg on his face. And we've been denied that. Like we should have seen it coming. The cruelty of the world as it is. Yeah, I know it's it's tough, but I'll, I'll take what I can get when when it comes to, to it's better the than him winning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Um, let's see, before we get on over to our, uh, to the Sunday slate, uh, got a message from our friends over at blue wire. We also have a friend, a message from our friends over at no house advantage. No house advantage is changing the game by offering the most dynamic fantasy sports platform available today. Pick and play in pick them contests versus other people for the shot at winning big cash prizes. Download the app, choose a contest, select your player props, earn points for correct picks, and climb the leaderboard for your shot at hundreds of thousands of dollars every week. You can also test your skills versus the house and 20x your entry if you hit all your picks. Bet on up to five player props, over-unders, or individual matchups across every major sports league, including NFL, NBA, MLB, PGA, MMA and NASCAR sign up with the promo code N H a wire. That's N H a W I R E at nohouseadvantage.com or download the app on the app stores and get a first deposit match up to $25. Make sure you check out no house advantage today and experience daily fantasy sports redefined because it's not just how you play, but also where you play. You don't want to miss out on this. All right. Onward to Sunday. So we got kind of a, a short slate this week um, as Everyone uh, who's tried to set their lineups already is, is keenly aware. Six teams on a bye this late in the season. Uh, not great for, for fantasy purposes, but you know we're, we're going to figure it out here. Um, so we'll start things out in Orchard Park. We got the Bills, nine-point favorites against the Jets. My take, Mario, this is the game that Mike White officially comes back to earth. And I think that the Bills... Um, you know, with a little bit of extra rest, ho hopefully Josh Allen a little bit closer to 100 uh, percent. They just kind of take it, take uh, care of business here and, and kind of reestablish themselves, because I feel like in recent weeks, uh, the Chiefs and now the Bengals have kind of entered the, the discussion as the best team in the AFC. And I think the Bills kind of like say their piece here on, on Sunday against a tough divisional opponent. Yeah, the Jets defense is definitely legit, so it'd be surprising if uh, even full strength Josh Allen got them to an easy, quick lead. But if nothing else, then over the course of the game, the Jets defense should kind of just get gassed and kind of just keep getting worse and worse field position uh, every so many drives. So, yeah, particularly given the home field, and I forgot to check if Von Miller was back yet uh, he's uh he's done for the season now actually oh actually oh my god what the hell happened um, yeah so uh, i think uh right it was uh it was flimsy like you know so he, the way he gets carted off on thanksgiving you're like oh that doesn't sound good and they said it's an acl injury it's like well how is he gonna come back from that and then uh, two weeks later they're like okay yeah no we we were full of it 
Anyway, uh, they still have a pretty good defense. They, they still have good defensive line depth. Not having the star players is not great. But uh, like you said, Mike White, he's he's better than Zach Wilson. That's just not saying enough, and, and not especially not against the defense as good as the Bills. And uh, being on the road, it's it's a, it's a tough setup. So uh, I I also think uh, Zonovan Knight. Not that it would be a bad look for him to struggle here with such an unfavorable setup, but uh, I've seen a lot of stuff about him being like some big deal now, and I I really don't believe any of it. And I, I kind of want to keep tabs of all the people. Uh, pushing this one because it's so silly like this suggestion now that like oh Zonovan Knight's ahead of Michael Carter like Michael Carter started ahead of Javante Williams at North Carolina Zonovan Knight was splitting the backfield with Ricky Person at North Carolina State and uh, he's got some of the worst size adjusted speed uh, size adjusted workout metrics so interesting change of play uh, change of pace player uh, which is you know what Michael Carter is too, but Carter is just so clearly superior. I, I can't can't believe some of the things people are saying now. Uh, anyway, it's easy to imagine the Jets getting like shut out in this one. Uh, so I guess my, my piece on on Zonovan Knight is I think he's useful for fantasy for the rest of the season if if you're hurt at running back. But I, I don't go any further than that. Like I, I don't think that he's going to be on my draft radar next year, especially with with um, you know Brees Hall coming back. Even though he'll be coming back off the injury, I do think that Michael Carter, like you said. Uh, the, the easily the the superior talent, um, but I think Knight. If it, it seems like he has a role, if nothing else, yeah, they're trying it. They're trying it, and he had that forty yarder, so they're going to keep trying it. But he's never going to get another forty yard carry in the league, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> okay, so good to set the record straight on that one. Uh, Jay has one more question for us here. Uh, he needs two uh, for a flex in PPR here between Hollywood Brown. Debo Samuel, Donovan Peoples Jones, and Rondale Moore. So, uh, think, yeah, sorry, just a second. That's kind of tough. Um, so, Debo, even even with Purdy, I think Debo, you're you're locking in there. Um, I don't, I don't trust that Rondale is going to be a hundred percent. So, uh, between Hollywood and, and DPJ, uh, I, I think the Brown, first two. I think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Hollywood for me uh, as as the other one. So Debo and Hollywood, Peoples Jones. Like I think he's interesting. I think the Browns will eventually get back on get on track with with this offense. But yeah, uh, I don't think it's this week. I I really don't. Um, let's see. Uh, I think we we pretty much uh, tidied everything up for that game. Let's get into that Browns Bengals game. In fact, uh, so the Bengals uh, six or six and a half point favorites, depending on what book you're looking at. Uh, they're at home. Uh, that I, I've seen a lot being made about how Joe Burrow hasn't beaten the Browns yet. Uh, I think one of the more kind of resounding losses of this entire season what was uh, the Bengals game on, on Halloween night against the Browns. I think they're a completely different team right now. And, you know, I think that that, that was like their first game without Jamar Chase. So Chase is obviously back, looks great. Um, it seems like they, they aren't losing a lot with, without Mixon. I, I forget if he's back or not th this week, but. P. Ryan is, is definitely playing a, a credible uh, RB1 type of role for, for Cincinnati. And Burrow is, you know, kind of tapping into that late season form that we saw a year ago. So I think the Bengals just crush him. I, I I don't know what to make of the Deshaun Watson thing. If he becomes vaguely the player he was supposed to be, then it should be a close game, one that the Browns could easily win. Uh, last week makes that whole question uh, for me anyway like impossible to sort through so i have no idea what to make of that i don't really want to just uh dismiss the, the the potential of chubb kind of taking over the game on behalf of the browns offense and or rather like making it a game on his own uh but yeah like you said the, the bengals are much better than they were the first time around the browns could be worse even with watson back and even though that you know the op the emphatic opposite was what was assumed all year, or at least, you know, most people anyway. Uh, so I, I think uh, I almost like P. Ryan more than Mix. It might just be that P. Ryan's got, like, you know, fresh legs from not getting however many 25 carry games Mixon has in the past three years. But P. Ryan's done really well, like you said. He's seems to be a better pass catcher than Mixon, which I, I really didn't expect. No. Uh, coming out of uh, with, with the respective 
two of them coming out of Oklahoma. But P. Ryan looks pretty slick. He looks like a lot more coordinated than he did with the with Washington. I remember with Washington, it was just their stupid field. But when he was with Washington, he'd always be like losing his feet all the time. And when you watch him, at least this year, he seems quite the opposite. Like he's he's really cutting and stopping and starting really well. So, uh, yeah, they should be, be at Mixon, P. Ryan, both. They should be able to run in this week. Browns run defense. And uh, in addition to Chase being back, uh, not that it's uh, – not that it's an in-season uh, change. It's more like a between-season change. Um, people might notice that Burrow has been running quite a bit more this year yes. than he did last year. He's been running almost like he kind of did at LSU, which uh, he, he's obviously not like uh, – he's not even probably like a Mahomes-level runner, but he's a lot closer than people think. And that wrinkle didn't exist – uh, in last year's offense, like he he was still coming back from that knee. So right. if, if Burrow can keep leaning on that escapability, uh, especially if that's a way to kind of like offset whatever liabilities Zach Taylor might have as a play caller, the Bengals could be pretty tough. And, and I got to give credit to Taylor, too. He's definitely been calling a better offense the past uh, couple months than he did to start the year or that he did any year previously. Burrow ran for 12 touchdowns uh, his last two years at um, at LSU um, and, and ran for, I think, like over 300 yards in each of those seasons. So, yeah, he's got some some juice to him uh, in, that, in that facet. And I think, if I remember right, uh, he might have been like Mr. Basketball in Ohio uh, coming out of high school. So, so I did not know. Uh, like he, yeah, so he, he's definitely like an athlete. Um, yeah, like, like you said, he's not quite on like the Mahomes level, but you know, like that functional running ability is certainly in there when plays break down. And that's great because the offense is like still not like awesome. Rodgers or something like that, like that kind of running where it's like if, if it's open, yeah, he can run for a couple touchdowns in a game because uh, he, he, he'll just be able to do that. And uh, that, that's, that's big because it's like there's there's probably plays last year or even this year where he you know could no one was open and he couldn't escape and he either threw it away or made like a bad idea throw and now he can maybe just run for a first down and then that that opens up a whole lot more the next time they're in that same situation it's like there's not going to be there's going to be like a spy or something instead of double team on both Higgins and Chase no exactly so uh, it's it this offense is starting to look really good. I, I, we'll tie it up here with, with uh, one one more question as it uh, pertains to Deshaun Watson. Obviously, he's been like a huge fantasy storyline all season, huge storyline in general. Of course, we, we don't need to dive into all of that. But um, when it comes to, you know, if if there's a fantasy manager out there who stashed him or picked him up, obviously you're feeling pretty bad about how things went in Houston last week. Do you – think that he's start worthy this week i have no idea how to give responsible advice on this one like i i gave some people like the thumbs up on starting him last week because i mean i don't i don't know what else i could have done about it you know it's not your fault it's not your fault i I know but it's like it's just it's like the right call was to say no don't start him Uh, i don't know two-year layoff um maybe his he he maybe his conscience actually like woke up a little bit and he's racked with guilt that he didn't have the last time he played. I don't know. Maybe it was just some kind of chance unrelated to those two things. I don't know. But like the whole justification for taking Deshaun Watson as a late round flyer this year was when he comes back, you got a top five quarterback, no questions asked. And I didn't think to push back on that at the time. Um, I kind of more or less was like, yeah, well, whatever he's, you know, he's only going to play six games. I don't care. I didn't think about like, well, what if he also sucks? And uh, that appears to be what we might have. So it's like the, the, you know, it didn't occur to me to think like, well, maybe he'll be bad because uh, it didn't occur to me before because I never even thought about it that long. But it's like, you know, he Vanderjacked uh, after he like ran his mouth against uh, Peyton Manning and he came back. He had the yips and like couldn't make a field goal ever again. Like maybe Deshaun Watson, uh, you know, being away from the game, being isolated, being probably isolated with some of the weirdest people on the planet, by the way, like who would, who would hang out with that guy and like be, be in his inner circle over the past couple of years, other than like some of the biggest freaks on earth. And like, maybe he just kind of got broke by it all. It's, it's possible. So I, I have to just like abstain. I, I have no idea what to tell anybody with Watson at this point. Yeah, it's, it's really tricky. And, uh, 
yeah, I, I think for me for this week, uh, I am uh, I'm out on on starting. Yeah, I'd rather him not. If you have I'd him. rather yeah. not. Yeah, you, you've made it to this point. Just uh, you know, you, use whichever other quarterback got you here. Um, let's go. Whew. Uh, we got Cowboys Texans. Oh, good. Uh, so they're back to Davis Mills. Yes. They're like, hey, uh, Cowboys are in town. Who wants to get uh, their head ripped off? Davis, you, you, you got it. You got on? a big neck, Davis. Go ahead. <laughs> who's a who's our most close lineable quarterback? Uh, <laughs> all right, Davis, you're in. Um, it's it's rough because that Dallas defense. It's uh, you know a played out point by now, but they they literally have like eight frightening pass rushers and the m- most frightening pass rusher in the league, arguably leading them. So it can get as bad as anything we've ever seen, I guess. I don't know why. I don't know what's stopping it from getting to that point. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, there's a reason why this is, I believe the biggest spread that we've seen all year. Um, you know, I think last week, uh, the, the Dallas game, the way they just kind of took advantage of a terrible team melting down in front of them in the fourth quarter. I think, you know, something similar, except I don't think that Houston is hanging, hanging around for the first half in in this this one. I think this one's a wrap pretty quickly. This is a Malik Davis game. Malik Davis kind of game. Um, I don't know uh, what, I don't know what, like even Damian Pierce, who I, I still think he's good. And it's, uh, you're seeing some some really aggressive skepticism of him coming out, which every time this happens with one of these like mid to late round running back prospects, these are not people coming forth with like new concerns. They're just people who like were dug in that know he's bad. He has low draft capital in the first place. And they're just coming back out of the wood that they scampered into when, when there was some light put on them previously. And uh, they're just full of it. The Texans suck. The Texans also in recent weeks have played a lot of run defenses that just are no go. So that's, that's what's happened to Pierce. He's still good, but uh, yeah, no one can be good in this offense. Maybe, maybe Nico Collins occasionally. And in, in, uh, when he gets this like 10 target games, but everything can be denied against this pass rush. Like they, they could, it's, it's, it's almost just like cruel how, how you've, if you follow the throw to catch up script against Dallas, you get further away. Like it, it doesn't help you. No, it's, it's a brutal, brutal setup for, for Houston here. I think that this, this goes down as one of the bigger blowouts of, of the entire season. And, you know, as the spread reflects like that, I don't think that there's a spread that, that, that Vegas would post that I would, I would still be backing Houston basically like it just, it just, it's not going to happen. It's I don't know happen. what the spread is. And I take Dallas to cover. Yeah, it's it's sixteen and a half. It was seventeen. Sounds good. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah, it but, uh, yeah. Give give me that all day and literally twice on Sunday. Um, let's get on over to a game that that's a lot more interesting. And I, I think that the spread is one of the bigger storylines this week, where the Vikings are actually underdogs on the road against the five and seven Detroit Lions. That is a little weird, and um, I'm obviously a, like. I'm kind of one of the leading Dan Campbell defenders out there. I, I, I can't claim to really understand that one. The The last time they played, uh, it's easy to forget this because the Vikings ended up winning, but the, the Lions were basically whooping them all game. And uh, Justin Jefferson was like just blanketed by uh, Jeff Okuda, which is, of course, absurd and, you know, even as far as even as far as Jefferson having a bad game and Okuda covering him. It didn't happen because of Okuda stopping Jefferson. It was more like, like many times this year, Kirk Cousins has just played poorly. I don't know why he's. I mean, we know where the the decline has happened. It's not Jefferson. Uh, he's he's just insane. He's basically Jerry Rice, I guess. But KJ Osborne went from, uh, I think he was like seven point six or seven point seven yards per target last year, catching like sixty two or sixty percent of his passes. He's now down on a greater target volume, I want to say, too. He's, he's doing something like five yards a target and catching like half of his targets. So that decline in Osborne alone explains why the Vikings offense has been dysfunctional and why Kirk Cousins' yards per attempt has gone down and his completion percentage has gone down. But I don't know why that happened. I can't figure out why it should be so hard to just get him the ball, uh, you know, 55 percent, 58 percent of the time. 
uh, six and a half yards a target, even at the worst. So uh, it seems to me there's something about the scheme that just doesn't suit Kirk Cousins' ability to throw, especially to the middle of the field, uh, especially in like base functions and in, in structure. So I, I, I had once would say like this, this Lions defense is kind of just nothing and, and Jefferson should go off uh, if, if I know he like I know he didn't already once this year, but that just that just means you're that much closer to being out of luck. I think anytime you get you get a bad game against Jefferson, and uh, the question is like whether anybody else does anything. Hawkinson kind of alleviates the problem of of like the Osborne decline because he's he's running in the same part of the field and he gives a bunch of like yards after the catch kind of stuff uh, that that uh, doesn't require Kirk Cousins to play well. But yeah, I'm just trying to figure out, like, being in Detroit, where golf is sometimes good, better than Stafford, I would even say, John, and uh, at home, he's better than Matt Stafford, uh, yeah, maybe that could kind of provoke a, a bit of a shootout, even though the Vikings' defense has been pretty good this year. Uh, and if it does, I, at that point, I guess I, I don't just take it for a given that Kirk Cousins keeps them in it, but... Even even with the Lions getting the better of the Vikings for uh, 90% of their first game, it still felt wrong the whole time. It still was like, how is this happening? This doesn't make any – like, it's the Lions. I don't think Cousins is good, but I, I've never seen him be this bad either. So, I don't know. Maybe, I, I, I don't want to pick the Lions to win or cover or whatever, but uh, – I, I I do see it in as far as like the the Vikings do suck. I just think mm-hmm. it's not likely to be against the Lions that their point differential penalty uh, like shows up in their record. Right. That that's more against the the Cowboys of the world. Uh, yeah, as, yeah. As we yeah. saw a couple of weeks ago, uh, I'm I'm weirdly on the Lions. I think that that the line is so strange and and unexpected that I'm just gonna take it as it is and just kind of go with it but um Fair enough you know it it could obviously go backwards I, I don't think that uh you know good games against the giants oh, John, you know, listen to this sorry maybe this has something to do with it um i guess both sides are dealing with a fair amount of illness but uh at least as of wednesday there was cj ham daniel hunter this theo jackson fellow Patrick Peterson, Harrison Smith all out with illness. So Ooh. I don't know. Maybe there's maybe there's something to keep an eye on there. I I would th- I would say so. Um, but yeah, my my point being like Sorry. I'm not taking their their win uh, the Lions win over the Jaguars as like some some sort of like big like arrival. But I, I do yeah. think that they are just kind of a solid team. They're, they're more who they are now and, and who they were in September, where they were feisty and playing you know, mostly good football, mostly good offense. Um, I think October there with each passing week, we're kind of putting that in, in the rear view mirror. So I, I give the Lions a, a good chance to, to win this one and to cover even, even though like, you know, you just see the record disparity 10 and two versus five and seven. You're like, how, how possibly, but I think there there's, there's a reason behind it. Um, let's see here. Uh, one quick, uh, defense question. We, you know, a couple of really good ones here. So this is tricky. Uh, the chiefs, they are playing in Denver, and Seattle is hosting uh, Carolina. I know that Foreman w- was a little bit dinged up, didn't practice yesterday, as far as I know. Um, so there's, you know, I think really good cases for either. But I lean Chiefs. Um, I-, I think that the the Broncos' offense is just that bad. Yeah, I I think I'd lean Chiefs too, and they have. Um... I think a little bit more convincing of a pass rush, maybe uh, like I know Nuwosu's done well, but uh, for Seattle, but the chiefs have just a lot of ammunition in the front seven. They sure do. And you know, that's just, it's just not going to go well for, for Russell Wilson, um, who I saw on the, on the internet this week uh, has less touchdown passes than he does uh, toilets in his home this year. So uh, you must have like, Five he's got like toilets. twelve. He's got like twelve oh. toilets. <laughs> like a, you know, the, there's never a line for the bathroom at Russell Wilson's place. But at the same 12 time, twelve toilets. Man, that's a lot. What the hell do you want twelve toilets for? <laughs> Freak. Yes, some of them are for, are for show. Enthusiast. You know, the, yeah, ornamental. Um, but uh, you know, hey, that's don't what, that's use what we that get. toilet. That's just uh, that's a decoration bathroom. That, that's the one that, that's my prized possession. I got it from the first Jackass movie. Uh, this is the one that Dave England used. Um, but uh, Russell moving Wilson's on. not that cool. No, he's not even close. I don't think he's even seen Jackass. Um, 
let's see one one other item that that doesn't totally relate to to this week because they're on a bye um but the falcons are making a change at quarterback yeah did you see this um yeah i i don't know if arthur smith was like planning on making this change at a certain point in the year but as much as uh as much as Mariota was really bad and as much as i don't know uh as much as I, I, I liked Ritter within reason as a prospect, like some at some point with quarterbacks, I kind of just like have to throw my hands up because I don't know what the league thinks. And uh, the the league will, you know, kind of the, the league will know more than me about quarterbacks. I'll, I'll say that like there's or some cases they, they do, you know, in some cases they're so stupid about quarterbacks themselves that just any random person on the Internet could do better. Like, say, like, you know, for instance, take Mahomes, not Trubisky. Um, but, mm-hmm. um, I'm sorry, Jack, where, what, what, what game was I on here? Sorry. I, uh, we, the, the, we, the Falcons, right? Sorry. Okay. Sorry. The, the Falcons a, are, a, are off this week. So like it, we, right, this sorry, isn't I, a real, I had a frozen tab throw off my whole thing there. Um, anyway, uh, the Falcons, you know, that, that Ritter fell to the third round. I don't mean to make that sound like he's definitely bad just because the league thought he did. I mean, like. They've definitely like Dak Prescott fell to the fourth round, and the only reason he did was because, uh, or rather, the only reason he fell to Dallas in particular was because the Raiders took Connor Cook earlier in the same round. Otherwise, Dallas would have took Connor Cook over Dak Prescott too. So that da- uh, that Desmond Ritter fell to the third round doesn't mean that like if you liked him as a prospect that you have to just defer to the NFL's judgment. Like they get they get stuff wrong all the time at quarterback, but it still is not a good sign that he fell as far as he did um he's he's not a young quarterback prospect like a, he's at least 23 i want to say uh four he, years he starter. looks he looks older than me <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's so he, he started four years so yeah of course he wasn't going to be young and he, he did improve over those four years but uh it it's it's concerning to me that ritter came into the nfl too skinny at, at yeah. that age it's like if he was if he was a junior, you know, third year early declare and he weighed at 6'3", 208 or whatever, I'd be like, oh, whatever. He's, you know, he's going to bulk up eventually kind of. But at his age, he has to bulk up to get to like 210 at 6'3", which means he's skinny and he can run. He's got like the 4'5", 240 or whatever. And and uh, he, he plays quarterback kind of like technically well, I think, but just kind of worried that he's a case where maybe like the tools just aren't going to like, like he's not skilled enough to, to project very well for the particular like tools that he has and, and his ability as a runner. I don't know how much you can leverage that with the kind of frame that he has. Like he has the same 40 as Mariota, but Mariota is like 10 plus pounds heavier than him. So uh, they're not going to necessarily be able to lean on Ritter as a runner the way they had been with Mariota. Like he might need to throw a little more than Mariota which, uh, you know, that's welcome news if you're a Drake London investor, but it it might get kind of uglier yet, even as bad as Mariota was. Yeah, that I mean, because, you know, also like in addition to, you know, your prospect analysis there, like there's the fact of the matter that, you know, not a ton of weapons there in Atlanta. And this is his first taste of, you know, NFL starting quarterback. And he's coming from Cincinnati. It didn't look awesome against Alabama last year. <laughs> So, I mean, I'm not saying that 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 dooms him because, I mean, they were so overmatched on on the in the trenches and everything. But, yeah, I'm skeptical about uh, Ritter being the a proverbial fast starter. And if he does start fast, I think it comes back to earth ra- rather quickly. Well, I think I'm more interested in him for like next year. We'll, we'll see what's up. But uh, I think that th- this is basically the Falcons. They, they got to a point. They got to their buy that they, they were able to assess where they were within like the, the pecking order of the NFC South. They're not eliminated from, from contention yet, but the way that they've been playing, I think that they are probably starting to realize uh, that they were in over their skis the first six, seven weeks of the season. And they they are a little bit more who we thought they were. Um, so I think that explains the, the move. And yeah, I just, I don't see this going particularly great. Um, and I, I don't think that this is like good news if you're a Drake London haver, anything like that um let's see here uh moving on to our next game we've got uh the eagles and the giants um speaking of the eagles 
Uh, Jay wants to know if uh, Hertz has passed uh, Mahomes in the MVP. So looking at the odds, Mahomes is actually still the leader, um, but Bert, uh, Hertz, I'm sorry, is pretty close behind. Uh, plus 125 for Mahomes at DraftKings, plus 175 for for Hertz. So he's he's right in that in that mix. You can still get Burrow at nine to one. That that interests me. Yeah, I would put Burrow ahead of Hertz and probably Josh Allen too. Even though I know he's had a rough go. If if Josh Allen has like two good games and the Bills get home field advantage, that that's all it would really take with him too. That's it. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, he was like the prohibitive favorite uh, to start the year and you know up through the first six seven weeks of the season, but yeah, obviously it's, it's slowed down a little bit hurts and Mahomes, and, and now burrow have overtaken him. So, so Allen checks in uh, with the f- number four in the MVP odds right now. Um, let's see here. Um, touching back on, on Dak Prescott for a second, would you feel comfortable starting him this week, given the you know potential blowout game script? Uh, well, it's, without knowing the alternative, I, I would definitely not, dissuade anyone from starting Dak it it probably won't be a heavy lifting game for him but he could uh you know if if the if the Cowboys intercept two passes in the first half and neither of them is returned for a touchdown that would make it easy for Dak to get the kind of game where he's three or four touchdowns on 25 pass attempts or something like that so probably not much yardage but um I, I don't worry about like a bad game specifically it's I guess it's more the upside that I wouldn't particularly get my hopes up for so his, his other options would be deshaun watson tom brady tyler huntley mike white uh ryan Tannehill, or brock purdy so i guess some of those are, are waiver right. wire options um yeah i don't think it's like maybe maybe Tan- no no I'd, I'd stick with Dak. i think yep yep so yeah it's unfortunate there's probably a little bit less upside in this scenario for, for Dak, but uh you know brady going out to san francisco that's going to be tough. Um, Huntley, you you just have to pray that he runs for two touchdowns because he's definitely yeah. not throwing for two, and he's definitely not throwing for more than like 200 yards. So that's just – yeah, your your options are a little bit limited there. I think just take what you can get from Dak and hope that, you know, when when the Cowboys pull him, that he's done enough to attribute to that, to that scoring. Um, let's continue here. Um, oh, yeah, so we were talking Eagles-Giants. Uh, so the Giants, seven-point dogs – at home yeah that's probably correct i mean they they're a team you have to take seriously even if you're the eagles but the giants are just kind of they've been overachieving we knew that uh, we knew it would have to correct at some point and even if they're still playing pretty well which you know they're they're not an easy win against even even when you beat them even if they're due for more losses uh with that said the eagles are maybe they're certainly one of the teams that I would be least worried about sleepwalking into a game. Like I know they, they lost to Washington. They had a close call with Indianapolis. They're still 10 and one. And it's, uh, it's easy for them to, I feel like just kind of like show up each week and uh, kind of match that, like which is basically what the giants have going for them. It's like Dable has them showing up every week. And um, I would, I would sooner worry about a team like Dallas or something like that. Um, screwing up here but the eagles uh just not i just i, I think uh miles Sh- miles sanders should have a good game whoever is getting carries should have a good game the giants run defense isn't very good uh, it might be because they need to give so much help to the pass where they don't have a dory jackson even and their other corners were pretty bad to start with so uh, if the giants try to particularly stop the run game then they're just leaving aj brown and Devontae smith one-on-one which that will be a faster way of losing yet. Yeah, no, that that's obviously a concern. I actually am on the Giants at, at this number at seven. Um, I, I don't think that the Eagles it is lose. A lot. It, yeah. It's a lot. And the Giants have been good against the spread at home. And the Eagles have not played particularly well on the road as, as it goes with, with the spread. They're just one and four against the spread on the road. They're coming off such like a, an emphatic win last week. I, I don't, I, you know, I've, I've Definitely agree with what you're saying where they they aren't going to like, you know, take their foot off the gas. Maybe that Indianapolis game was sort of their wake up call to to not do that and to take everyone seriously, especially when you have a divisional game against a team like the Giants that, you know, is going to be, you know, giving 100 percent, even if they don't really have the talent to really match you. Um, but I, I think the Giants, 
the way that I kind of frame this game is we'll know pretty much right away uh, how this one's going to go. Like, I think if the Eagles start hot, this one's done. But if they get off to a slow start, that's exactly where the Giants want them. And and then we see like kind of a slog where where the Eagles win like 20 to 16. And it's like kind of tough all the way. Yeah, uh, that could happen. I just um, I, I look at the Colts game and the Washington loss is more just what happens in most seasons to, to even most good teams. It's like, you, you know, most, most good teams uh, lose four or five games and uh, the Eagles, it's getting harder and harder to find where they're going to lose this year. So uh, I, I think, I think they, they kind of, we're, we're facing more likely we're just facing like a, a regression kind of like a bad luck stretch. And I, I think they weathered it pretty well. You know, the consequences yeah. pretty minimal. And so uh, the, the giants are, are going to be a lot, like I think Dable will have them pretty frightening and like more up to what the Eagles are now, but it's just uh too many injuries in the secondary and not enough, uh, you know, they, 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 they have Darius Slayton and the AJ Brown role, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's certainly not, and I like uh, Slayton, mm-hmm. but it's, it's yeah. just a little, little bit overexposed in that capacity. hundred percent. No, that's t- totally fair. Um, and then, you know, if the giants have success, generally it's because Saquon gets going. Yeah. Obviously the Eagles were able to slow down Derrick Henry last week. Do they replicate that this time around? Well, uh, it seems at, at the very least we can say that the Eagles' run defense looks a bit different with um, with Sue and with Linball Joseph there than it did beforehand. And uh, the, in other words, they might have made the Jordan uh, the Jordan Davis injury kind of like inconsequential until he's back. Whereas be- before they signed those two, they were getting beat up on the ground quite a bit. So if that's over, uh, I, was kind of, I was talking about this with Jim on the radio. Friday uh, or Saturday, sorry, um, where uh, sometimes it's actually good for Saquon Barkley to maybe face a better run defense, a better base run defense, because if that other defense, if that other team decides, hey, we don't really need to sell out to stop Barkley. We have a good run defense. Let's let's uh, let's take like a balanced approach on defense. That actually helps Barkley a little bit because he he just needs that space made for him. And even even though he's, uh, you know, he's like a a big guy who will break tackles and stuff. If as a defense you sell out against the run and specifically make your containment and gap alignment such that you're just trying to keep Barkley in front of you all the time, he kind of won't get out. Like he just, he kind of just kind of run into traffic a lot. Uh, whereas when you play a regular base defense and you don't sell out against the run, he's more likely to get like one linebacker in a one-on-one matchup and he can make that guy miss or run him over uh, he, it's, he's more likely to get away from the swarm of tacklers in any case. And that's when Barkley's at his best. So uh, if the Eagles try to do like a balanced defense thing, they, they just make it more likely that TJ Edwards or somebody gets one-on-one matched up in, in the phone booth with Barkley. And if he doesn't make that tackle, then Barkley can go the rest of the way. So I don't worry about the matchup that much, uh, even though the Eagles run defense is looking a lot better. Um, but it's it's still an ongoing concern of, of a team just kind of selling out to, to stop Barkley because it's it's the smart thing to do. Yeah, no, exactly. So well, well said there. Um, I liked that breakdown. Um, let's see here. Got a couple of questions. Uh, Tim has been patiently waiting. So we got you, Tim. Uh, from the, the waiver wire of these options, who do you like? Uh, let's see. I think, I think I think I think you mean Slayton, Chark, Corey Davis. Uh, Demarcus Robinson, Zay Jones. Chark, obviously, recency bias would lead you there, but recency bias could have also gotten you a Demarcus Robinson a couple weeks ago or a Zay Jones last week. So yeah, I'd go with Chark because uh, it's a home game for Detroit, and he is the kind of receiver that, uh, at least for Dantzler, like Dantzler's. Wait, is he on IR now? I think um, he. I think he's coming off of it. I okay. think I saw. Uh, so, so Dantzler is tall and lanky. Like he can probably defend Chark underneath, but Chark's not really playing underneath anyway. Chark's uh, more so running kind of like posts and flies. And Dantzler really can't run with with Chark. P- Patrick Peterson might be able to, but he's we got to keep an eye on that illness with him. So, I, I, home game golf is is a really good start for for Chark. And the, the other guys on that list, I feel like just kind of don't even have that kind of thing going for them. It's mostly like difficult circumstances for them. 
Yeah. And uh, what was I going to say? Uh, the the over under in that Lions game is like 52 and a half. So like that. Yeah. Let's go with Shark. Yeah. Let's just play play the percentages there. Um, another question from him uh, between Waddle, Gabe Davis, uh, and Chris Olave. Uh, we're picking one from this list. I am. I'm having trouble. I'll say uh, yeah. I'm not too. Uh oh, we're having the, the connection monster back. He's making an appearance. Um, I I would I would go with Waddle. I'm just gonna say them in, in some kind of order here. I think uh, I I definitely get Waddle in and Andrew second, Olave third. Yeah, that's my. I'm going Waddle, Andrews, Olave in, in that order for me. Uh, John, are you there? <laughs> uh, oh, he's kind of breaking in. That struggles. Yes. Hmm. I'm gonna have to send a message to John. I don't even know if I'm coming through. Uh, let's see if I can establish uh, correspondence here. Man, what is what is with it with the uh, the Atlanta area internet folks? Can't believe this. Um, let's see, what else do we got here? In the event that my feed is going through, I'm just going to take the liberty of moving on to the next game. Oh, John's on his way back. It appears so. Uh, Sorry about that, folks. Uh, I, I think we're going to just move on to the Chiefs-Denver uh, really quick because uh, it shouldn't take much time. Chiefs are going to win that one. The question is how much uh, the Broncos, 3-9, and nine, when, when something like 18 points per game would have them, uh, like 10-2 and two or whatever. It's incredible. Uh, they'll need to score more points than that against the Chiefs, however, and uh, the, the their actual ability to do that. Uh, not established to this point, to, to put it nicely. So uh, let's let's say Chiefs by uh, 35 or something like that. Good luck, Denver. Uh, Seattle, Carolina. I guess that one's not a very even game either. We got the Panthers with uh, Sam Darnold, I guess, is better than what's his name and that other guy. So that's interesting, I guess. But uh, MVP Geno. Doesn't care either way. He's gonna. He's gonna. What is this? Six down to four. Wonder why that is. Hmm. Kind of concerning. Uh, I guess that might be due to the Kenneth Walker injury. That is a big deal, I suppose, especially with Travis Homer beat up. Uh, oh, hey, there's John. Hi, uh, John. I, I started talk. So I kind of just skipped the Chiefs Denver game and uh, sure. started talking to Seattle Carolina. But yeah, anyway, nice. I was trying. I was surprised to see. It uh, looks like. Upwards of uh, 80% of the bets are on the Seahawks, and yet the line has dropped from six to four. So, uh, so some some Mr. Moneybags guy maybe is on the Panthers a little bit. I'm on the Panthers, to too. It, yes, I'm on them to cover. Um, I, I think Seattle has obviously been a lot of fun. I think they've been one of the most fun stories in the entire league this year. They've got some really like interesting young players. But I think the, the Panthers... They don't have uh, Baker Mayfield anymore, and I think that that gives them a shot. And I think also the fact that they're coming off the bye, I think that that helps. They'll be a little bit more well well rested. I think they can keep this one competitive. I'm not saying that you know the the Seahawks look past uh, the the Panthers or anything, but I, I think that the Seahawks just seem to be liable to to get into weird games against teams that they are better than. So I, that's kind of where I'm coming at it uh, from. Fair enough, and. Uh... Looks like Carolina gets back Miles Hartsfield, who's a pretty good slot defender. I, I got to say, if if Deontay Foreman can't play and can't be his usual self, I don't know if I trust the Panthers to make it competitive. But yeah, admittedly, I don't know how the how the Seahawks are going to run the ball reliably without Kenneth Walker. Uh, I like Travis Homer. I'll say that if Travis Homer and his knee issue or whatever his latest injury is. Uh, Yes, me. If Travis Homer can play, I, I really do think he can play real running back. He's, he's kind of just been their, their passing down guy 
over DJ DJ Dallas, uh, who's sick too. So they got backfield questions, but I, I will say if, if this comes, if the question of whether the Panthers covers comes down to whether Travis Homer can step up, I, I actually, I actually am belligerently optimistic for Homer's part there. Okay. All right. That, yeah. I know, I know you've been a Homer Homer for, for a little while, so can definitely yeah. see that, you know, how to do it. Um, it's let's coming. see, but it's, it's almost here, John. <laughs> um, before we get on over to our next game, got a couple more messages from our sponsors. Lead things off with our friends at Pickett. Pickett is a social bet tracking app that takes all the hassle of tracking your bets and performance over time. Pickett connects to every major U.S. sports book that's DraftKings, FanDuel, and others, and DFS pick and providers like Prize Picks, Underdog, Thrive Fantasy, and more. Once you hook up to all your sports books, Pickett does all the heavy lifting to slice and dice your betting data. You'll get detailed historical PL graphs, breakdowns by team, sport, player, bet type, and more. You can also line shop for the best odds across your link sports book to make sure you're getting the most bang for your buck. When your bets are live, you can track the scores and stats of the games you've bet on, as well as get player prop updates for most major player prop markets. No more switching between your sportsbook app and different score apps. By far the biggest differentiator is that Pickett syncs history and bets from all legal major sportsbooks. There's no manual entry required to track your bets. Once you have your accounts linked, it's effortless from there. The social feed and community is what turns Pickett from just a bet tracking app to a home for betting, where you can learn from others, see what others are doing, and find verified content to inform your betting decisions. Visit Pickett.com, that's P-I-K-K-I-T.com, to download the Pickett app today, not to be confused with Kenny Pickett. Um, And then we also have a message from our friends over at Monkey Knife Fight, football is officially back on Monkey Knife Fight with all the NFL action you're looking for. And if college is more your speed, they've got plenty of that too. On Monkey Knife Fight, there's no sharks, no salary cap, and no math. It's just easy to play, easy to win, daily fantasy player props. Join now at monkeyknifefight.com and you'll get your first game free. Then use promo code RWNFL to get your first deposit match instantly up to $100. So what are you waiting for? Join Monkey Knife Fight today. All right. Onwards, so we we just knocked out a couple of those afternooners. Uh, let's rip the bandaid off, Mario. Raven Steelers, how bad is it going to be? It's it is depressing to think about, John. Uh, for both teams, I, I don't want to make it sound like Baltimore's in a, uh, you know, and I don't I don't think they're doomed quite for this game anyway. Uh, Kenny Pickett is still really bad, and this is. This is a really weird defense that the Ravens have, and I, I, I have decided again I hate their defensive coordinator, John. Oh. But uh, because at the very least, like these 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 non Humphrey corners, it's like something something needed to be done differently, and uh, that includes the game planning. Like there's just there's there's too much there's too much that they're giving up at the non Humphrey cornerback reps, and it's 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 driving me crazy. And it, if it makes Kenny Pickett look passable for another week, I'll just the inconsolable. Mm-hmm. So I need them to either step up here or, uh, and, you know, make Kenny Pickett look bad, hasten his transition to slot receiver where he may yet be salvageable. Uh, or they need to, to fire this guy whose name I still haven't learned. Cause it's just driving uh, me insane. And if Mike I see McDonald, Mike McDonald, Mike McDonald, Mike McDonald, the DB brothers. Uh, Oh, uh, that's great uh, for him. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the Steelers, if if they get like George Pickens running against whatever the, that Houston one who I can't learn the name of either, uh, if I see that yeah, he I'm hasn't just... been playing much, Pepe. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's it's Brandon Stevens then who's mostly getting and Peters I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah I, 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 I could see I guess... Peters and Pickens getting in a fight on Sunday. That's probably they should. That's actually what uh, Mike McDonald should instruct Peters to do. Just try to get Pickens ejected, and if Peters gets ejected too, you still call it a win. Because then you can just have Humphrey on Deontay Johnson, and then it's then it's a wrap at that point. So that's what I would do. I would I would try to get uh, Peters. I would try to trade a Peters ejection for a Pickens ejection, and then I I would love the the Ravens' chances to cover here. So offensively, big story: Lamar probably not playing. We've seen this movie before with Tyler Huntley. He looked like Tyler Huntley last week. Did enough yeah. to keep them in the game and ultimately win, win the game, but uh, the 
def- it, it turns this team into a complete fantasy wasteland, in my opinion. Like, it, I mean, like it wasn't great the last few weeks, even with Lamar Jackson. So with the drop down to Huntley, I think is, it, it can't be overstated. Yeah. Lamar is awesome, but the Greg Roman system entirely unserious as it is, it makes such little use of Lamar's abilities that I actually don't think they lose anything at all <laughs> other than Lamar's <laughs> running ability. Uh, when they switch from Huntley to Lamar or to, to Huntley from Lamar, uh, There are throws that Lamar Jackson can make, namely anything like 10 plus yards downfield, which Huntley cannot. But in the Roman offense, you forfeit that function anyway. It's like it's 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 not supported properly. You can't act on it. Let Lamar be a better downfield passer than Huntley. Neither of them is doing anything downfield in this offense. It's not happening. It's out of the question. So they strip down the playbook to suit Huntley's limited abilities. But in practice, they get the same result, which is. you know, piddly little check down stuff, forcing it to Mark Andrews after standing around and hoping someone gets open. Nope, no one did. Okay, throw it at Andrews. Hopefully he, uh, you know, can catch it in between three guys hitting him at the same time. Yep. <laughs> That's what the offense is with Lamar Jackson and without Lamar Jackson. So uh, that changed to Huntley. Uh, yeah, it's surprisingly little changes for everybody else. And um, the defense, if they're aware of that, they can make Huntley look worse than he did last week by just. It, the key against Huntley is don't defend 20 yards downfield. He can't throw it. You you might as well be – you are you should be about as concerned with Kenyon Drake throwing a 20-yard pass on you as Tyler Huntley. It's just not going to happen, so don't defend that part of the field. Defend every single play as if it's a red zone or better yet, goal-to-go offense, and that's when Huntley will really fall apart and his running won't be able to bail him out. So I, I wouldn't be shocked if Tomlin has a good game plan along that that those lines, and I think it would work. Because Greg Roman will get out coached, out thought. It is a given, and there's no Lamar to uh, make uh, the win, you know, a, a given either. So I, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough spot for the Ravens. But if they get Pickens ejected <laughs> with with Marcus Peters, they have a shot. I, I wonder if there's uh, like a prop anywhere for for that um, to to see if <laughs> fight, if, fight if, if prop. If, yeah, the the Pickens Peters parlay for the ejection. Um, yeah, they, all, they should have a parlay that. where it's that you project you project. Uh, yeah, two two ejections and a and a, a team money line, and you get uh, whatever a, a zillion dollars. Um, yes. Uh, then then I can be a zillionaire finally. Um, let's grab a couple of questions here. But my bottom line here: Steelers are going to win. If you can get it at two and a half, you're living right. They'll they'll win by Fair at least enough. a field goal. Um, Ravens are trash. Golly. Um, let's see. KJ wants to know. Dulcich or Hunter Henry in PPR? Um, who do the Patriots got again? Uh, the Patriots uh, Monday night in Arizona. That is tougher than I thought it would be, but um, I'd still go with Dulcich because uh, – it's it's been Nate Hackett's dream his whole life to to build an NFL offense around an epic uh, mustache and and uh, what was it what was the thing like oh you know Greg Dulcich drives a seventy eight Trans Am or whatever oh no oh you know that sorry that wasn't Hackett that was just uh that was that was a quote from my favorite uh, football analyst I uh, can't remember his name but <laughs> uh, Greg Dulcich uh, I I think he's only like an average kind of player but. Nate Hackett really has nothing else. Him and George Patton, they they said this year, like, we're going to make this the Dulcich offense. They're doing it. They're living the dream. They're not letting anyone stop them. No, they're not. So get, give me Dulcich as well. Uh, Matt Leahy, uh, no relation to Jim Leahy as far as I know. Uh, thoughts on Rashad White versus Jamal Williams in PPR this week, with you know, considering that he already has Swift starting. So I, I think you diversify and go White. but Yeah, because um... – yeah, the, also for what it's worth, the Vikings, I'm pretty sure it's safe to say, their run defense has been better than their pass defense. So um, not that that's going to stop Jamal Williams, or not, not, and even more so, not that that's going to like make anything a given with Swift. But I would definitely go with Swift over Williams. And yeah, like you said, John, at, at that point, I'm, I'm pretty much locking on to White just because uh, I, I don't think the odds favor the Detroit cumulative backfield uh, having like 
a, a second spot to, to, to give that's more than what White will have. So it's like Swift might be the wrong choice, but once you make that choice, it's like I, I got to go with White the other way. Exactly. So that, that's where I'm at with it as well. Um, let's hit Titans-Jags. Yeah. Okay. What is the... Let's see. I kind of we don't got, want we got the Titans to play. I know that that looked scary last week. I was shocked that he came back in. Yeah, there's no reason to have him in this game. And if, if there's no Trevor Lawrence, there is no game. So Titans win question is like by how much and uh, do the Jaguars manage to like uh, destroy Trevor Lawrence's career by by needlessly putting uh, some, by, by getting him to develop some sort of like chronic midfoot condition after a pl- having him play on a on a busted foot it's not great it's not great uh what's going on there and i hope they don't do that yeah (laughs) here you know here i was like a week ago saying like this was this was the start of the trevor lawrence era but yeah i i underestimated how cursed the jaguars are so uh, oh well um let's hit we got three more to get through we got uh bucks niners to to lead us off here so are we brock purdy pilled (laughs) um i will say i'd be surprised if purdy were worse than like nick mullins cj bethard types not going to take it for a given that he's better but i would also figure that i mean i cj bethard was a third round pick but no one liked him everyone thought that pick was awful uh nick mullins was not as good at Southern Mississippi as Purdy was at Iowa State. Not that I, not that Purdy was like great or anything. He was so he like regressed over time, which I yeah I, that was that was weird to me. Yeah, that was concerning, and he it wasn't for like a lack of pass catcher help really. So uh, that that's all concerning and stuff. But Shanahan, I think with with the personnel like Devo, Kittle, Ayuk, McCaffrey. It's it's uh we, like we've seen Mullins and to a lesser extent Beathard have enough decent starts that uh and and Garoppolo was was also mediocre enough himself and and still yet producing that I I would be kind of surprised if the, if the Purdy switch just like totally undid the 49ers offense like I still I just don't think Garoppolo is good it's like he's he uh he can let a system conduct itself but he he at most will ever be like a product of a system so. Uh, Purdy probably is safely worse than Garoppolo, yeah, but I, I think that same fundamental uh, – the, the nature of the offense always was like a system that exists and has some other players stepping into it. Like I don't think they, they go down with Garoppolo exactly, whereas uh, Tom Brady just seems done. And, uh, yeah, I don't, I, don't know what, I don't know what the Buccaneers can do really here. I mean, they, uh, they might be able to – get like Mike Evans in the slot or something like that to, to just be taller than Jimmy Ward. But I, I don't know. I, I, every, everything you think through, and, and also they've had a bunch of good matchups over the year that they haven't been able to capitalize on. So give them a, a bunch of bad ones. And it's, it's hard to see why this would go right for the, for the Buccaneers offense. Right. Now I take uh, next to nothing away from their comeback on uh, Monday. Oh, yeah. They sh- They should have been screwed by that punt. But Dennis Allen outcoached the bad outcoaching decision, you know, by by uh, just you know basically doing a hurry up to give the ball back to Tampa Bay after you give Tom Brady enough chances. Uh, and someone in one of our like football chats astutely also said that people are just stupid against Tom Brady late in games. Like for whatever reason, teams just start to just wilt and their brains start to melt and like just bad things happen to them. I don't. So may, maybe he still has that psychic power in him, but counterpoint. Not, mm. Dennis Allen seems to have that happen to him most weeks. So <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe touchdown Tom's. I can't think of any more T words to keep it going. Uh, but his his luck, John, uh, I think was was just a, a flicker of it last week. And yep, uh, it's time for some correction. It's time for some pain, Tom. Time for yes. you to suffer. I think, yeah, it's it's happening. I think the Niners are, are going to oblige uh, to that end. I love the Niners minus three and a half this week. Um, speaking of the Niners, their last opponent, the Miami Dolphins, 
Uh, they're going to Los Angeles to face the Chargers on Sunday night. Should be a pretty fun game. Uh, my entire fishbowl season like kind of hinges on this game because I, I'm sick. I'm a Tua Waddle stack guy with also Justin Herbert. Uh, nice. So last week I barely, barely survived the cut line because it was just abysmal from all those guys. But this week, you know, we hopefully this this bounces back. I guess all the projections really hated the my, the Dolphins going into that game, but then the Dolphins scored on the first play, and you're like, oh well, well. But <laughs> no, it uh, you know, can't, comes back. Tua gets injured a little bit late in that game. Um, you know, what what are your thoughts on, on the Dolphins heading into this one as as actual three point? Uh, favorites on the road three and a half at some places yeah um chargers i'm trying to think of what i would expect from their offense like i i never want to expect a, an easy game for the chargers passing game because it's just poorly devised and i don't think there's a lot of help there but the the miami pass defense has been pretty bad most of the year and they they kind of uh i don't know if they're they're not like vulnerable to to the Chargers type of personnel or anything, but uh, I, I just I don't see anybody in the, the Miami secondary who can like stop, like decisively stop any of like Palmer, Allen, uh, certainly not Eckler. So a Herbert big game I, that would that would make things pretty interesting. Like I, if, if for me to feel safe picking the Dolphins, I need to kind of think like Herbert struggles a little bit because I can imagine Tua struggling a little bit also. Uh, not not because it's uh difficult matchup exactly it's it's not but i would imagine j that uh brandon staley has noticed this this tendency of the miami offense to have in breaking routes in the underneath and intermediate and until the the dolphins show another wrinkle i guess you'd want to just kind of keep a robber or two in that part of the field uh to just kind of sit on those routes and make to a make a downfield throw uh instead until he can prove it anyway and uh, so Jeff Wilson, I think, has a big game, and I think the Dolphins will be able to run the ball. But uh, as far as Tua just, like, picking up right where he was before the 49ers game, I don't know. I, I have trouble believing that, even though it's, like, a definitely a better matchup than the 49ers just because there's, there's no Fred Warner, but it's, like, Derwin James, you could probably cook up something pretty good in that part of the field. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. But, uh, yeah, the, the Herbert big game, scenario would put pressure on Tua to step up and it's it's not like uh i'm surprised how how little uh confidence i have in that happening just because I, I think if you keep Ty not that it's easy to do this but if you keep tyreek and waddle in front of you and and you just sort of uh dare to uh, to try that deep ball threat instead you can you can do a bend but don't break kind of thing maybe until wilson runs uh for a touchdown anyway and, you know, I think there's also the fact of the matter that I, I don't think the two of his ankle is going to let him be particularly mobile in the pocket. Not that you're like counting on him to run necessarily, but I, I think having a statuesque quarterback back there is not great when your offensive tackles are what they are. Right. And, and I guess Armstead might be out again. And uh, Jackson, they did, they did get a uh, Jake Fisher, former number one pick. Um, really? So, yeah. <laughs> Jake Fisher. Oh no, Eric Fisher. Eric, oh uh, shoot, uh, yeah. J Sorry, I started. I, 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 I don't know who Jake Fisher is, but I started to think of Jake Long, and I'm like, isn't he like 43? Yeah, um, it's uh, yeah, is a real Jake Matthews, Jake Fisher Eric was that Fisher. Oregon tackle, wasn't it? Yes. I don't know. There's a reason Crummy. you had that name pop up. I think there was like an Oregon tackle named maybe Jake Fisher. Anyway, Eric Fisher, yes, uh, still pretty old, but but not Jake Long. <laughs> That's a, that would have been pretty insane. Yeah, but either way, uh, not uh, not good, not good. Um, so yeah, I, I like the Chargers to cover. Uh, I think that uh, you know plus one fifty on the money line. I'd I'd be interested in that against the Dolphins. Um, let's wrap it up. We've got Patriots, Cardinals, Patriots anywhere between one and a half to two and a half point favorites out in the desert. I I have no I idea. I hate this game. To... I hate this yeah, game I... so much. <laughs> it could be a really ugly game because I, I think Belichick's defense is largely kind of like outdated. There's some things that he's doing with his past defense strategies that I kind of hate, but I think it's exactly the kind of thing that Kingsbury's offense might struggle with. Like the basically just press man coverage where, you know, a, you do the press part pretty well. You actually get some effective jams and B uh, you credibly defend the first 10 yards. Like, 
don't get me wrong, none of those corners can cover DeAndre Hopkins one on one and uh, Marquise Brown. He's dangerous too. But if you sort of just uh, jam those guys up a little bit and and then otherwise bank on like the inability of the Cardinals offense in general to run downfield, like you can you can do some pass rush stuff, you know, run some stunts or whatever. Get Kyler Murray looking flustered because he's he's uh you know he's 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 waiting for like a clean pocket to set not just a clean pocket but like defined throwing lanes to to, to materialize so he can know where to start looking because he's got to make like a special effort to see anywhere before he considers throwing it there. And it's like if you run a bunch of stunts like Dietrich Wise having a really big year, Jiron having a really big year. It's like you guys you put those guys a certain place before the snap and have them rush in a different place after the snap and I, I can really imagine that. Uh, in conjunction with an effective jam, causing a lot of problems for Kyler Murray, and uh, he'll he'll have that jump ball to force to DeAndre Hopkins. But aside from that play, I don't know what they have in this game. And the Patriots' run defense is generally pretty good, so I, I feel like this could be a really rough game for Kyler. There's going to be a ton of Call of Duty uh, viral posts and things like that. Uh, the the part that's less uh, the part that's more confusing for me is is the the Patriots' offense and. Like, I don't think the Cardinals' defense is good, but they have some talented players, like, especially at linebacker. It's like Isaiah Simmons and Zayvon Collins can make big plays. Uh, Buda mm-hmm. Baker is obviously quite good. I think Vance Joseph is a very good defensive coordinator, but that's that's all that they have going for them. And uh, just the same, I, I can't trust the Matt Patricia Mac Jones offense to take advantage of something if it's there. And, and I don't know what it means that – the Cardinals mostly run zone coverages. Like I, I don't know. Like does that does that? I don't know what that means for Mac Jones exactly. Uh, but Mac Jones, it would be pretty discouraging, disappointing if he had a bad game here. Even though there's there's certain parts of the Cardinals defense that are pretty good, they've generally struggled to cover the middle of the field, especially the tight ends. So uh, that's why I had to pause about that Dulcich Henry question. It's like normally Henry, I don't like at all, but. Arizona just does not defend the tight end at all. So maybe even Hunter Henry could do something. And if Hunter Henry has a good game, then at that point, all you really need is Mac Jones to have a good game from like one of Parker or Jacoby Myers, ideally two, of course, but he only really needs one of them to be good in this game to project for like a 230, 240 yard kind of thing, which is actually like a start with Mac Jones. It's like we're, that's, that's, we're just hoping to get to like 250 yards and two touchdowns. And it, it'll be a, a big success if so. Uh, but yeah, it's just Vance Joseph is is a much better coach than Matt Patricia, so it, it can go wrong from the New England side too. No, it definitely can. It's it's tough to trust New England. I was just kind of thinking back through my head uh, while while you're talking there. Why are the Patriots on national TV so much this year? Like that, Tom Brady's been gone for a while now. Like we can we can kind of stop pretending that they're an interesting franchise. Like this is um, what, like their fourth national TV game this year. Like, yeah, it's like when they lose, I don't, I'm not like, ha ha. I don't feel like I'm getting. Yeah. Anything. I don't I even it. have the schadenfreude anymore. It's, it's yeah. like they, they, they bore me. And then I, um, I don't, I don't get it for cliff either. I mean, he looks so just uh, exhausted all the time on the sideline. I just feel bad for him now. Um, and again, to be fair to cliff, he has made some changes, not, not enough, but more changes than I thought he had in him to his offense, whereas Steve Keim, the, the guy, the, that just lumbering oaf who uh, is probably the owner's caddy or something. Like, I don't know why they like him so much and they show him in hard knocks, just like hanging out in the box and the owner's telling him bad jokes or whatever. And Steve Kime's just like, oh, this is great. And uh, it's, it's working out great for the Cardinals as well overall. But uh, I think they lose this one in a really ugly game. It's just... Ugly suits Belichick fine enough. Yes, it's, it's not going to suit Kling, Kingsbury as well. No, so that that's where that's where I'm leaning with it too. Uh, if you can get it at one and a half, great. I, I still like the Patriots at, at two and a half too, though. Um, so yeah, in on that. I just the, the Cardinals have like a negative home field advantage too. They've won like eight home games in like the last three seasons or something. Like it's <laughs> it's. I don't know. It's no bueno. Um, one last thing uh, to touch on here. Uh, Chaka chimed in here at the end. A quick Raiders backfield question. Uh, who is the handcuff for, for Josh Jacobs? Is it uh, Zamir White or Amir Abdullah? I was tempted to say Brandon Bolden, but he hasn't been playing offensive snaps really at all. 
Right. He hasn't played an offensive snap in something like three or four weeks and only like one in the last five or six, something like that. So uh, I, I I think if you need like somebody to give you points now, it's Abdullah because he's playing something like 15 to 20 snaps a game anyway. Um, I don't know how much that number can go up if Jacobs isn't playing. It, it could probably go up to like 25, 30, probably not higher than that. And if Bolden's still playing zero, not that we can easily assume that in my opinion. Like if, if Jacobs misses time, then Bolden might start playing offensive snaps, which would which would be annoying, but that's just how it works sometimes. Uh, but if Bolden stays special teams only, then even if Abdullah plays 30 snaps in the event that Jacobs is out, there's still upwards of 30 more snaps that White would be eligible for. And I don't think to this point he's played more than like eight in a game. So I would in a way say it's White, even though he's – has uh you know nothing to offer you in the meantime and abdullah can give you like some points conceivably right i think zamir white can uh just like, i don't like, think he's gonna be in on passing down stuff is no not at all no terrible with that but uh as far as like just if you need a hammer between the tackles he can do that yeah. I just uh, I don't know if yeah, I mean you're definitely not going to get the returns that you would with, with Jacobs in those setups but I mean Bolden probably would play snaps because yeah. Abdullah like Jacobs is getting a lot of passing down snaps Abdullah is a passing down specialist but Jacobs is still getting a lot of passing down snaps which means if Jacobs is out it's not just the 20 carries it's like upwards of 20 25 routes and Abdullah can't take all of those. White probably can't take much of any of them. So Bolden would get passing down snaps. And I think you'd see White cap out at like 20, 25 snaps with like upwards of 14 carries, but not much more than that. Yeah. So J- Jacobs really is like the the linchpin of that whole thing. I don't, I don't think that there's like an obvious like uh, lottery ticket in, in that backfield if Jacobs were to miss time. Um, but that's going to wrap it up. For us here on uh, the Week 14 Fantasy Football Preview Show, again, presented by our friends over at No House Advantage for Mario Puig. I'm John McKechnie. Thanks for listening. Try Rotowire today, free for 10 days. Get our premium tools, rankings, analysis, and breaking news alerts. No credit card required. Go to rotowire.com 